Hi there. Thank you for downloading and listening to the 4 Million Years Later podcast. This is a show where two old friends who grew up with the Transformers franchise and never fell out of love with it get together to revisit the original cartoon in story order and convene to talk about what we saw, looking at it from the perspective of our experience with it as children and our relationship with it growing up into adulthood. My name is Jersey Drost. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is named... I am Hoover, and I'm back. <laughs> he is back, but just just plain Hoover this time. Just, just plain Hoover. Just, just plain H-O-O-V-E-R in black type on a white box. Yes, <laughs> just like that. <laughs> Uh, we haven't had a conversation about generic packaging from our childhoods yet, but I'm sure we will at some point or another. Good to talk with you again about Transformers. Always good to be here. Always good to chat about this lovely topic. <laughs> That's true. We do feel that way about it. I, I, I don't think about that often, but yeah, we do think it's a lovely topic. <laughs> Okay, so what do we, we do an episode a week, and you know, last time we explained that we're doing this in story order from here on out, which means that you know you can't go to Tubi TV and watch it in the order that they have it there, or off of your DVDs if you have DVDs. Is it on Blu-ray? There's no Blu-ray, right? Nope, no Blu-ray. No. So we have been trying to do our part to telegraph at the end of every episode what we're going to do next. But just in case you missed the last like five seconds of last week's episode, <laughs> what, what are we doing? And, if, and in case you haven't read the title <laughs> to the episode of your podcatcher, what episode are we doing, Hoover? Attack of the Autobots. So the Autobots finally attack the Decepticons and win. Yep, this is the final episode of the series. So here we are in the 20th episode of the podcast and the cartoon, and Attack of the Autobots is written by David Wise. Mm -hmm. This is the first time we've seen that name in the list. It's his very first episode, but we're going to go on to see him 12 other times in season two, so he will be a very familiar name with us in time. Mm -hmm. And then we'll see him again. He's going to skip over season three and go right to season four to do Rebirth parts one through three. Oh, wow. And unfortunately, he passed away on March 3rd, 2020, at age 65. And Transformers was not his only franchise that he helped shape, right? He was a prolific cartoon writer, wrote a whole bunch of stuff in the 80s and 90s. Mm-hmm. You pull up his IMDb, it, it's a lot of 80s stuff in there. Ah, uh, well, all right. Well, let's see what a David Wise episode looks like, at least starting out. Uh, let's start with the log line like we do every episode. While distracting the Autobots with a surprise attack... Megatron secretly sets a trap inside their base that will force the Autobots to do his bidding. Oh no, attack of the Autobots means that they're going to attack the good guys. Mm, Uh-oh. Yeah. I don't know how I feel about this one. <laughs> this episode, uh, okay, do we want to do any 10,000 feet of views of like uh, overview of how we feel about it before we dive into the moment by moment? Mm, I mean, I remembered it Yeah, from my childhood. I remember it being a very memorable episode just because you see Autobots trashing things. But it also got sort of mixed up in my memory with Megatron's master plan, which is uh... kind of similar to a degree. Mm -hmm. So just like whenever you see Autobots acting out of character, it's sort of all got lumped together in my child mind. <laughs> This uh, this is an episode about the Autobots basically turning bad, and the way they do it, they become, it's almost like Incredible Hulk, kind of like, there's a couple Autobots who like act a little bit more like sinister bad guys, but like for the most part, it's, we're watching them tear up the place. <laughs> and, and I think, again, this is further evidence to our earlier hypothesis that like once we start getting towards season two... It feels like it's being written for a slightly younger audience. And we talked about this in a past episode is like this idea that like a lot of adventure fiction for young people or just like storytelling for young people, really young people, tends to be a, a lot about emotional management. Like, how do you manage your feelings? You have big feelings. What do you do with them? You know, Mr. Rogers. What was Mr. Rogers mostly about, right? How to manage your feelings and, and manage, you know, a sense of self-worth and everything. And that's, I feel like as I watch this episode again with, from that perspective, I'm like, yep, that, I feel like that's what this episode is really about. But I do have a memory of watching this as a kid. Now I was, I had to be 11 or 12 by the time this episode aired. And so I don't, I don't think like the, the big feeling stuff was, was connecting with me as much, but certainly the authority figure being frightening 
like connected with me and that mm. which happens in this one the fatherly figure like being like realizing that like there's a time in your life where like parents have ultimate power over you right and i mean it really feels that way to little kids like you you don't have any say in anything you know it's like because i said so that's why well mm-hmm. gosh that's 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 tyranny in a nutshell <laughs> <laughs> and so like when mom and dad don't feel like they're your friends like it feels really i remember how that felt as a young kid and like that i feel like the the, the scene towards the end of this episode that we're probably going to spend a lot of time talking about and i'm going to have a lot of big feelings about for a lot of reasons it, it points to that but also, I think similarly to some of the other earlier episodes we talked about, there's a lot of silly stuff in this one. A lot of silly stuff. Well, we start this one already hearing the quote-unquote exciting music. It's like there's no ramp up, there's no crescendo, no getting to there. We just hit the ground running, and the exciting yeah. music is already playing. Yeah. And we pan around the front of the base on a starry night as we see multiple somethings approaching. Also, rare instance where we actually see the moon in the night sky. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's worth noting or not, but I, I picked up and I was like, oh, that's interesting. I, I, now that I think about it, you don't often see the moon in sunbow backgrounds. I just don't often see them at night in general. That's true. It's always daytime in the sunbow universe. <laughs> <laughs> the Transformers don't get up until the sun is already up. That's, that's why true. Megatron always wins. He's always up <laughs> early figuring out what the Autobots are doing. <laughs> we've hatched more schemes against the Autobots before 9 a.m. than most people do all day. Mm-hmm. So it's night, and we see something in the distance heading towards the Autobot base. And then we cut to the inside of the arc where we see Optimus, Blue Streak, and Ratchet building a fort for their action figures on a table or something. Yeah, it's weird. They're like they're they're working at a table. And they're like hunched over, but we see what they're working on, but it just looks like they're building little boxes of something. <laughs> it's like generic, like working on the computer kind of thing. Like we're fixing some some components of Teletran 1. Or my hypothesis, my, my Jersey theory is they're continuing repairs of the inside of the arc. Because remember, as the series goes on, we're going to see less and less of those rocks jutting out of the walls and the, the busted mm. screens and everything. So I think they're fixing the place. Well, whatever they're doing, suddenly Teletran 1 warns that the Decepticons are approaching, and Prime gives the order to transform and roll out, as we see Prime, Ratchet, Brawn, and Prowl speed out of HQ. And who approaches but our favorite F-15s, the Seekers, Starscream, Thundercracker, and Skywarp. They fire on the speeding Autobots, as we cut to Soundwave, ejecting Rumble and Laserbeak to quote, distract the Autobots. A battle breaks out between Thundercracker, Laserbeak, and Prowl, who we see pull a strange little device that he plugs into the end of his rifle, and then he also hooks something to that device. We see him fire at Laserbeak, and it unleashes some kind of bolo weapon, which snags Laserbeak's feet and basically keeps him on a string as if he were a kite. This is weird because it's like, it's so specific what prowl does here like he pulls out his rifle and then he pulls out this like little mechanical device that looks like a silencer or something and he sticks on the end of his rifle fires it and yeah it expands into a bolo whereas like not you know 16 17 episodes ago he would just like pull his hand into his wrist and Mm -hmm. then out would come a laser net you know to like capture ravage maybe mr wise didn't get the note that they can like pull their hands into their forearms and basically turn them into anything (laughs) but it feels very I don't know. It looks cool. It looks. I'm not. I'm not criticizing it. It's just. It just feels out of place given how we've seen them operate up to this point. Yeah, it's it's inventive, but just sort of yeah. a little strange. Just a little odd. But then Prime and Ratchet are attacked by a missile from Skywarp, which blows mm-hmm. them both across the screen. And then they have to contend with Rumble's pile drivers ripping open the earth like a fruit roll up, as it always does. And then the pair both fall into a crevice. Take note, City of Steel. That's how it's supposed to work when Rumble uses his pile drivers. <laughs> <laughs> this episode just starts like it. It's very, very fast. I mean, like, like, yeah, we ha- there's, there's no not wasting like, any time. No, I mean, like even in some of the episodes, what kick right into the story, like a few seconds in, at least they'll be like, "Oh, here's the Autobots having a conversation at home," and like, if you ask me, the Decepticons are behind these quakes, Optimus, you know. Mm-hmm. No, no, it's just like, la, 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 we're working. Whoa, we're under attack. And like the fight yeah. just happens. And we're still at the point where it's not like super imaginative fighting, but at least it's not like them just hiding behind rocks shooting across a field. Mm-hmm. But but yeah, so like 
each of the Autobots is getting taken out or like sort of occupied by something. So what is Megatron up to? That's a good question. We cut to Megatron and Starscream. This is the moment I've been waiting for. Now, Starscream. Excellent. My invisibility spray will provide the perfect cover for this operation. The Autobots can't defend themselves from the Septicons who aren't there. <laughs> Oh, boy. <laughs> what you just heard there was Megatron and Starscream spraying themselves with, quote, invisibility <laughs> spray. And we see them emerge from an aerosol cloud uh -huh. as white outlines of themselves. Like literal, like, cartoon ghosts or invisible cartoon people. Just like they showed... Wonder Woman's invisible jet on Super Friends. It was just yeah. a white outline. But like because it's Transformers, they go this extra little distance where instead of it just being a pure white outline, it's like a shimmering white outline. Like they <laughs> actually have like an Energon sort of like shimmer inside of the lines, which it's a cool looking effect. But again, it's like, well, what a weird thing to come out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. And I've got some other issues with it coming up in a second, but it just feels like this is so emblematic of the kinds of sort of, I wouldn't even call it a MacGuffin, but like a device used in a lot of children's cartoons from the 70s through this period, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, I think Invisibility Spray goes all the way back to like old Warner Brothers cartoons, doesn't it? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I couldn't name the examples, but I, I feel like this is something that it felt familiar enough that I'm like, I, I know I've seen this at least a half a dozen times <laughs> in other cartoons. And what a, what a weird thing for Megatron to pull out of nowhere, right? <laughs> it also, it's begging for Starscream to be like, mm -hmm. Megatron, if we've had this for this long. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Some kind of critique. But as we'll find... Starscream doesn't say anything this episode. <laughs> wow. So we're two minutes into this, and already it is off the rails. <laughs> I mean, kudos to them for not being super formulaic and just cranking out the same exact type of episode with just different characters and scenes swapped out. But invisibility spray? Really? Okay. <laughs> I mean, like, especially after such a specific probably using such a specific like technological device to stop laser beak right it's like mm -hmm. like you can come up with a dozen little like devices that megatron could introduce to be like this will shield us from teletran one seeing us right mm -hmm. but but no what are you going to use i'm going to use my invisibility spray to go sneak into autobot headquarters i'm going to put a pin in that as you like to say because <laughs> something happens towards the middle of the episode or i'm like well wait a second teletran one you know like one or the other <laughs> But there's a neat effect coming up, too, that I like. So, yeah, what is he going to do with his invisibility spray? Oh, so you'd think, since they're making themselves invisible, they could just walk right up to Prime and shoot him point blank in the face, right? <laughs> Boom, war ended. No, that's not what they're doing. <laughs> Instead, it's just to allow the pair to sneak into the arc and insert a, quote, personality destabilizer into the Autobots' recharging chambers. And they do so, and then Megatron and Starscream flee undetected. And Megatron explains, Tomorrow when those Autobots recharge their energizers, they'll experience a transformation they won't expect. <laughs> really? Okay, well, let's, let's keep going and we'll just hope this script starts to redeem itself. So we cut to Rumble. It's time to go back to the cute little Decepticon. He's been <laughs> waiting to hear Prime and Ratchet hit the bottom of the crevice that he opened up. But he's surprised when Prime and Ratchet both fly up at him, Ratchet calling him a turkey tron. <laughs> and I'm surprised too, because Prime and Ratchet aren't supposed to be able to fly. Also, I believe we saw Prowl fly a little bit in, this, in the early part of this episode too. So <laughs> this is another one of those things where it's just like, okay... He's he's new to the job. Maybe he didn't get like all of the the story Bible, and maybe maybe the Bible hasn't been updated since it, like episode one because they've been cranking these things out so fast, right? They just handed him a copy of More Than Meets the Eye. Here, watch this. You'll get the gist. It's like, yeah. Oh, okay. The Autobots can all fly. 
Yeah, yeah. I, who knows? I mean, it could be. But I mean, this is again, this is another one of those things that happens when you have a lot of people working on a thing and they're cranking it out really fast. Somebody missed the edit on that. Like, well, wait a second. They can't fly. We've established that by this time. <laughs> But yeah, they like literally like swoop out of the crevice. And he's like, wait, you know, Rumble's like, why didn't I hear him hit bottom? He says, we'd rather hit you, Turkey Tron. Oof. <laughs> Somebody was like, Doug Booth gave him a note. It's like, always come up with <laughs> silly, silly computer sounding things mixed with earth sounding things. And then we see Prowl flying laser beak like a kite. That is, if kites shot lasers at you. Mm. And then Megatron and the Seekers fly by. Megatron declares the mission accomplished and to return to base. So Laserbeak shoots the cord that he's tethered to Prowl with and frees himself from Prowl's hold and retreats with the rest of them. Soundwave takes off as Brawn exclaims, Hey, come back! You didn't finish your nickel-plated knuckle sandwich! So it's nice to hear Brawn being his good old tough guy self. And this is the second instance of that expression. I think the first <laughs> time was in Ultimate Doom Part 2. So I, I don't know if we... I'm going to keep my ears open for how many times we hear that. <laughs> Wherever there is consistency, let's celebrate it. <laughs> yeah. I like the idea that Braun has basically one plan with the Decepticons, <laughs> and that's his Bronco writing thing. And what if he has, like, one little retort that he likes to give all at the same time? <laughs> Hey, come back. You didn't finish your nickel-plated knuckle sandwich. Braun, get a new line. Come on. <laughs> I'm on brand. I'm on brand, guys. And then, he, then he takes an Instagram photo. Hashtag nickel-plated knuckle sandwich. <laughs> and then we have this cute little scene where Rumble narrowly escapes Ratchet's grip. I love by, this. This is by, so good. Uh, basically, Ratchet's chasing him, and then Rumble transforms into a tape and lands on the ground. And then Ratchet reaches down, but then Rumble pops up transforms to robot mode and flies away. <laughs> yeah, and then like flies up to Soundwave's torso and transforms into tape mode midair and goes inside of the tape deck. <laughs> it's a neat little piece of animation and it's it's like the transformer edition of pointing at the ground to like get your enemy to look down. <laughs> <laughs> but instead of pointing at the ground, he just turns really tiny into his tape mode. It's not like gorgeous animation, but it's really it's it's neat to see somebody playing with the fact that they can transform to do mm -hmm. interesting, like anytime they do imaginative battle, I'm always going to point it and go, see, see, this is why it's good. Yeah. Well, the Decepticons exit puzzles the Autobots and they theorize why all this transpired, but all Prime knows for sure is that Megatron is up to no good. Two things, two notes here. One, I'm glad the Optimus finally learned not to trust Megatron after Heavy Metal War. <laughs> Two, I feel like the performance of Optimus in this one is getting a little bit back to the John Wayne kind of performance. It's not all the way back to like episodes one through three, but it's it's got more of a lilt to it than he's had in some past episodes. He's he's still like fatherly prime, but he's not the stoic, stiff prime from Heavy Metal War, but neither is he like the stick it in neutral Megatron prime. <laughs> but it, it is nice to hear that lilt back. That was something I, I was I, I thought was especially nice in this one. So Megatron's up to no good. So then we cut, seemingly jumping to the next day, because now the sun is out. Mm. And we see Prime and Ratchet charging up in those aforementioned recharging chambers. They look like little beds with sort of clear cockpit roofs on them. Prime orders everyone to recharge as they've got a big day ahead. I actually kind of dig the design of the recharging chambers, how they like fold into the floor. Like, mm. we don't get to see a lot of the technology inside the arc. We really mostly only see Teletran 1 mm -hmm. and, and the Sky Spy occasionally. But, like, it's neat to see the other aspects of their lives. Like, what do they do when they're not fixing the place or looking at the monitor? You know? Well, they actually have to eat. How do they eat? Well, they have these beds they lay in. And the beds fold into the floor so that they can all congregate around Teletran 1. <laughs> <laughs> And speaking of congregating in front of Teletran 1, we cut to later, where a handful of Autobots are in front of Teletran 1, listening to a report of a new satellite scheduled for launch at the Harding Space Center. Prime is certain that Megatron will want it for his nefarious schemes, so he says, We've got to get to the launch site and protect, guard, defend. I, I feel very strange. And then suddenly Teletran detects a, quote, evil presence, present, as the Autobots' eyes all turn red. Also, we strangely hear Megatron's voice, presumably through the chip that he inserted in 
in the recharging chamber. I guess. I guess he has an audio link to Teletran 1, so we get this exchange. Very good, Teletran 1. The personality destabilizer I placed inside your recharging chamber has converted your Autobot friends from sentimental fools to my kind of mechanisms. Autobots are noble. Your plan can never succeed. Oh, it can't, eh? Autobots, obey my first command. Silence that annoying computer. Optimus Prime, no! no, no. Excellent! You're going to cause more havoc than this miserable planet's ever seen. <laughs> Here are my orders. So now we see Prime... Blue Streak, Brawn, Hound, Prowl, Skyfire, Trailbreaker, Ratchet, and Sideswipe, all with evil eyes glowing red. They're possessed, kids. Well, yeah, it's a nice, simple, cartoony way to express the idea, the, the complex idea of that their their dispositions are now different. So th- this is the part where I take issue with the fact that Megatron puts on invisibility spray and Teletran 1's like, what? There's nothing going ha- wrong. But then like the Autobots get a personality adjustment and the Teletran 1's like, I detect an evil presence. What about <laughs> when Megatron was in your, in your house? How come you couldn't detect him then? You know, does the invisibility spray like refract all, not just light, but all also like all other like sensory radiation right like like radar doesn't work on it and whatever other detections maybe maybe that's like invisibility spray in the transformers world is much more scientific but <laughs> but also there's a there's a piece that i've neglected to mention earlier when megatron starscream were like monkeying with the recharging chamber is that when megatron says like give me the component the personality destabilizer starscream opens a panel in his chest and while he remains invisible the moment he opens the panel you see mm-hmm. his innards like you like yeah. it's not outlined in white it's like actually in full color so it's like so it's further delivering this idea that it's an invisibility spray it only works on the surface they're not actually invisible <laughs> it's refracting light in some weird way but but yeah so they're the autobots are all just standing there and we like do this slow pan as we see them all with red eyes now yeah we've probably never expressly stated it before but all the autobots typically have bright blue eyes yeah that's the sort of visual shortcut to know that they're good guys <laughs> and Decepticons have red eyes, yeah. Yep. So we cut to the desert now, where we see Bumblebee and Jazz driving with Spike and Spark Plug within, returning home. And it seems our human friends have just upgraded Jazz's speakers, so they pause to give them a test. Bumblebee says he forgot his earmuffs, so he'll be going back to HQ. And he speeds off as Jazz begins seeing how loud he can get. We see Bumblebee enter the Ark, finding it empty, and Teletran 1 trashed. He finally comes across Blue Streak, who says he looks tired and should recharge. Yeah, let's talk about his delivery of how he, how he's talking here. <laughs> it's know. always fun to hear Casey Kasem be evil. Yeah, he's like, never mind that, you know. So this is another scene where the the music changes. So like you said, like the episode starts with like the exciting Transformers music, and like a lot of the season one music is is in this episode. But this scene, I was paying attention because like. I can't remember if the scene like super creeped me out as a child or not, but you can tell it's meant to be menacing. Bumblebee's the smallest mm-hmm. Autobot. He's the weakest Autobot. He has to be a spy because he really doesn't, you know, he, he's not going to like clobber sound wave. And now he's alone in the base with one of the warrior class Autobots. And the warrior class Autobot is being menacing, like in this weird way. Like, come on, mm-hmm. you want to recharge, you know? And so I was like, well, what do they do to like emphasize the tone? And the music is more of like the that other season two Sunbow music that gets used a lot in Transformers and G.I. Joe. And if I'm not mistaken, it also gets used in some of the other Sunbow shows like Gem or what was it, Inhumanoids. Mm-hmm. Do you think it would have been like somebody would have called halt on it if they actually put some like the really scary music in this scene? Because I feel like if it was lit a little bit darker and they put some of like the scarier Transformers music in the background, I think it would have worked better. Mm, maybe, yeah. It feels like it's suggesting that it's suggesting menace, but it doesn't quite get there. And I can't help but wonder if somebody purposefully made it a little less scary because we're aiming this at younger kids now. Because if you think about what's actually happening, it's pretty intense, right? Blue Streak like grabs him. <laughs> I wonder if also it could be that Bumblebee's just sort of confused. So yeah. To sort of paint it as even more scary with scary music wouldn't really accurately reflect Bumblebee's take on it because as far as Bumblebee Uh, knows, like things are just a little odd, you know? Yeah, yeah, good point. 
But I mean, the scene does end with Blue Streak literally grabbing him and picking him up. It's like, you're going to recharge immediately. <laughs> you know, and then Bo was like, hey, come on, let me go. We cut back to Jazz blasting as loud as possible, <laughs> much to the chagrin of both humans. And his music causes an avalanche. So he says, <laughs> like, wow, rock and roll with real rocks. And this causes the two to climb inside Jazz to prevent getting squished by falling rocks. Jazz then decides that the demonstration is over and he speeds inside the base. And there we find Blue Streak is carrying Bumblebee over to the recharging chamber. Jazz asks him what's going on, and Blue Streak pulls his gun on him and fires. But Jazz dodges and tells him to be careful. <laughs> soon evident that Blue Streak's intentionally firing at Jazz. <sighs> Jazz says he doesn't want to hurt him and throws a little barbell-looking thing at Blue Streak, who is then knocked out. Yeah, he's like, oh, what does Sparkplug say? It's like you, you, you hit his reset diode or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, it also, like, Jazz says the word man a lot in this one, which also feels a little out of place. Like, he, it, I think it's at least three mm. times. He's like, hey, Blue Streak, what's happening, man? What's going on, man? Okay, yeah. I don't know, that feels a little dated to me now. But, yeah, it is funny, though. Blue Streak first fires out. He's like, hey, careful. Somebody's liable to get messed up. And like, <laughs> wait a minute. He, he pulled his rifle out and shot straight at you, Jazz. <laughs> what happened to Optimus's right-hand man, operations specialist, you know? <laughs> well, he could just never conceptualize a Blue Streak intentionally firing on him, so it just doesn't crop up in his mind. Oh, look at you. He's just that trusting. because He's, he's, he's not a military strategist like Prowl who would have... <laughs> That's right. Said, wait, Blue Streak shooting? That means something bad. <laughs> Jazz is just freewheeling. There was a good line at the beginning that made me think of you, too. Like, when the Decepticons retreat, and they're trying to figure out, like, why did they leave so fast? They hit and run. What's that all about? And Prowl's like, he surmises mm -hmm. that they were too effective in, in their counterattack. <laughs> I do like that they're having Prowl say things that are very military strategy. It's yeah. very, very good use of his character. Yeah. So, yeah, so he knocks out Blue Streak, and then Sparkplug runs over. He's like, ah, oh, looks like you hit his reset diode. He's going to be out for a while. I'm like, okay, so if you punch Blue Streak in the stomach, he passes out for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> and then Spike rescues Bumblebee from the recharge chamber, and Bumblebee is absolutely baffled by all this. So then we cut to later, where Sparkplug is repairing Teletran 1 with Spike, Jazz, and Bumblebee with him. Teletran roars back to life and explains the plot to the group. Because Teletran understands everything that has transpired. Mm -hmm. Sparkplug asks how many Autobots recharged and are now under Megatron's control. And Teletran's reply is, all of them. Yeah, yeah. So I think we may have skipped over this a second ago. But when Megatron orders, I think it was in the audio clip, Megatron orders the Autobots to go to the air base and wreck up the place. Teletran 1's like... Yeah, they, they won't do it. They, they'll they'll defy you. And Megatron's like, "Oh yeah, watch this!" And he has Optimus mm. smash Teletran one in the basically in the face, right? Mm -hmm. And so they reactivate him, and he's like talking all choppy. He's like, "Megatron hurt the Autobots," you know. You see Bumblebee and Jazz and Spike and Sparkplug. They're the only ones left, and they're standing there with their mouths agape, and they're like, "How many got infected?" And he's like, all of them. And just as he says that, and then like the the Autobot or the Transformers music like builds like the the big like mm -hmm. da 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 da. -da. You see, mm -hmm. just before it goes to black, Bumblebee gently puts his hands on Spike's shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> and what I infer from that, what I like to think in my my fanon, is that he's like, oh, Spike, we're going to need you more than ever. <laughs> 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 because the humans always make the Autobots a little bit better, right? And Bumblebee knows it. <laughs> but probably they were trying to do like, he's like, oh, Spike, I'm worried about you. I hope you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Well, technically, it doesn't seem like it's actually all of them. There seems to be... A few notable ex exceptions here, like we never see Gears, yeah. Huffer, Cliffjumper, Windcharger, or Sunstreaker. We never see any of those guys in this entire episode. But, okay, that's all of them. I guess Teletran's automatically not counting people who are off base somewhere. Maybe they're visiting Greece or Italy or who knows? Mm. Who knows what they're up to? Yeah. All of them that are in the immediate vicinity. Yeah. <laughs> he, he had an asterisk on that, but they didn't ask precisely. <laughs> so this is our first commercial break. Where yeah. Where Teletrans dropping the bomb that all of them are under control. So very nerve-inducing. I think so I need to recharge. I think since things are so tense, 
Maybe some circus fun cereal will get us through this. Mm, oh, now, do clowns. you remember circus fun cereal? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I have a vague recollection. It had a clown on the box, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Oh boy! I had completely forgotten about it until I stumbled upon this YouTube video. <laughs> but then it was instantly like I had no idea I had the information still in my brain. Right. But I knew like the entire line, like it- all of the lines of the commercial. Oh my gosh, that's that's upsetting. And it, it was like a fruity cereal with like different shapes that had to do with circus things. It was like, mm-hmm. like puff, puffed rice or whatever coated in sugar, and it was like green and red and orange and purple and whatever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was, there was no mystery what it was about. It's just all circus related stuff in a bowl. <laughs> <laughs> but I bet once you see this, once you see this commercial, it'll it'll yeah. come right back to you. <laughs> yeah, it's circus fun right in your bowl. And you're gonna wanna comply and for horses and hoops, balls and bears, elephants and lions. What? Horses, hoops, balls, bears, elephants and lions. Oh. So so maybe I'll just have some circus fun cereal and we'll get through this, or maybe I'll just play with the G.I. Joe Havoc, because nothing's too tough for Havoc. Nothing's too rough for Havoc. Well, you gotta love all those G.I. Joe jingles that they made. <laughs> so good. Especially when they always tried to rhyme the last line with G.I. Joe. Yeah. <laughs> Cobra's gonna make sure we stub our toe. <laughs> G.I. Joe. That's pretty much it. <sighs> or maybe during this tense time, I might order the Sweet Pickles bus of books. Oh, yes. Yes. Because smart moms know how kids' minds grow. Smart moms know how kids' minds grow. Thanks, Mom. Sweet pickles. Call now. Oh, sweet pickles. Sweet pickles. <laughs> oh, well, we, we got to get back to this. Yeah. yeah we gotta eventually, get... we got to get back to the serious plot dangled in front of us. We return and we pan across a rocket base, presumably the one mentioned earlier. So we see a caravan of Autobots speeding towards a checkpoint, but instead of stopping and checking in, they crash right through it. And the guards say, there's no one driving. <laughs> but then it's like, okay, well, you, this mystery is going to be solved for you in about one second, because immediately, <laughs> right. immediately after that, they transform. Yeah. And the military guards all pull guns on them. The now evil Autobots waste no time wrecking some fighter jets parked at the base just smashing and tearing into them. We cut back to the Ark, where Bumblebee's bunch is consulting with Teletran on how to fix this mess. The computer warns them that Prime is attacking the rocket base, and Spike and Bumblebee head off instantly, leaving Sparkplug calling after them. So there's important matters to attend to. Bumblebee and Spike don't waste any time leaping into action. No, no, that's that's why these characters are great. My own personal failings are what I think are making me respond to them so positively because like mm-hmm. ev- any time I've ever in my life been confronted with like real threat, like I totally turn to C-3PO in The Empire Strikes Back where I just start stammering and try to talk the person down, you know, like, here's here's five reasons why this shouldn't go the way it's going to go, you know, and like mm-hmm. but not Spike and Bumblebee. It's like there's trouble. Let's go. Let's get there and fix it. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You guys are the weakest of all of them. And you always do that. I want to be more like Spike. I want to be like Spike Cooper, <laughs> and I'm never going to be. <laughs> well, now we cut to Ratchet and Hound arriving at a laboratory where they tell us they're there to retrieve the satellite plans for Megatron. And just in case we forgot, they have red eyes, so <laughs> they're bad. This is pretty cool, too. Like, you see them outside the building, but then, like, you start seeing them, like, crawling through the hallways <laughs> of the building. <laughs> Because <laughs> they're big, they can't fit inside human structures. But and it's also like they're kind of smashing through walls and stuff. I'm like, why is the floor holding them? But who cares? It's a transformer <laughs> show. They're talking robots. But it is cute to see Ratchet with, with evil eyes shimmying through a human hallway. <laughs> and we see a Doctor Harding in an office holding plans for her satellite creation. When suddenly a warning sounds over the PA. Doctor Harding. Doctor Harding. A party of enemy Autobots is attacking this building. Enemy Autobots? What could they be after here? The plans for my solar satellite. So this phraseology doesn't confuse her, even though they just said enemy Autobots. Right. (laughs) She just assumes that they're after her satellite plans. This is a calm and cool woman. Yeah. She gathers them up and starts to run, but we see Ratchet and Hound scrunched over in the hall, barely small enough to fit as they burst into her lab. 
With nowhere to run, she breaks the window with a chair and Holy jumps cow. out, her fall cushioned by an umbrella opened up over a table and chairs in the grass. Don't try this at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Harding, by the way, is voiced by Morgan Lofting, who plays Baroness on G.I. Joe and played a news reporter just last episode. And Ratchet orders that they chase her. Now, uh, yeah, this is like... Again, the humans are always better. She's told that, okay, there's a giant enemy Autobot outside your door coming mm-hmm. to get you. And instead of saying, like, what, what's an enemy Autobot? Because, like, that's what I think I would say. Instead, she's like, oh, yeah, they're probably, this is what their plan is. Okay, mm-hmm. clearly I have to jump out of a window. Hope something catches my fall. <laughs> Not only did they catch my fall. And she, this woman is a survivor, as we'll see later on in the episode, too. Right? Mm-hmm. But, like, she, she just, like, and she, like, waves to them and runs off. <laughs> I want to know more about this Dr. Harding character. (laughs) Well, we cut back to Prime and Prowl just smashing and annihilating more parked military jets. But suddenly Bumblebee speeds up to said base where he's almost fired upon by the troopers. The Spike yells out the window for them to hold their fire and the troops lower their weapons. Spike exclaims that they're there to help and that the Decepticons are controlling these Autobots. Bumblebee sees the carnage Prime's making and instinctively runs up to stop him. Mm. But then Prime just swats Bumblebee away, who pleads with him to stop. Yeah, there's some good acting here on Dan Gilveson's part, right? Like he's like he's like, I can't believe this is happening, and mm-hmm. he calls after Prime. You hear his voice breaking, right? Like this is too yeah. much to watch because they they do a pretty good job showing like the savagery of what the Autobots are doing. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, it, and, and I gotta say it, it, it looks upsetting to see Optimus prime Autobot dad <laughs> ripping up something with that ferocity. Right. Like yeah. even, even when he's like being really rough on Megatron, there's always a sense of like a little bit of restraint. He's never like savagely fighting, but he's being savage right now. And mm-hmm. so I feel like this scene is, this scene really works for me. Uh, and, yeah. and ending on that shot on Bumblebee's face where he's like calling after Prime and his voice cracking. Man, that's good. Yeah. And then we cut to a control center of the rocket base where an executive is saying they'll need to abort the launch because of all this. <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> and then suddenly Megatron Kool-Aid mans his way in, walking through the wall, claiming the operation is now under his command. He begins firing on all the computers, which is baffling because I would think <laughs> that destroying these computers would forcibly abort the launch. Yeah. But then we see Megatron has left some computers <laughs> be. It's not very clear how he did this. Yeah. Right. It, we should say the room that he's in, it, it looks like sort of a more 70s anime version of Mission Control from the mm. 1960s NASA series. It's banks and banks of computers in rows leading up to a big screen at the front of the room. And there's like a director sitting in the middle of all of this. And there's all like a bunch of dudes all sitting in front of the different terminals. Yeah. So when Megatron comes in and starts shooting up the place. Like it's a shot where we're looking sort of like up at him as he does it and he's just like spraying the room with his fusion <laughs> cannon and then like we just see like all those rows of computers exploding and the dudes are all gone thankfully they ran away but then like all of a sudden he's like sound wave take over the computer and like then we see there's like a, at least four or five rows that he didn't hit yeah <laughs> so this this whole scene is kind of confusing it's like what are you really after megatron what are you really doing here <laughs> so then Soundwave then unleashes a little extension from his index finger which he inserts into the computer. That's a handy little device. Megatron exclaims that now the launch can't be stopped, and he'll soon have enough power to dominate the universe. Mm. So it seems he's thinking big again after being (laughs) content with New York City last time. So Megatron then reveals his plan. Those bungling Autobots failed to get the solar satellite plans. But no matter... In two Earth hours, we will be aboard that rocket and on our way to Cybertron. And the secret of perpetual energy will be ours alone. So yeah, kind of a typical Megatron plan, it seems. He's got this thing that's going to make energy and he's going to take it. Yeah. Also, it's like... This is one of those things where, like, a couple episodes ago, Optimus was like, those rockets are nice for primitive Earth technology. <laughs> Megatron wants to take over this rocket after in the first three episodes he built like a full on Decepticon cruiser in, in the end of three episodes. In Ultimate Doom, he builds a full on Decepticon cruiser and he's like, Well, yeah, maybe I'm gonna take a shortcut this time and steal an Earth rocket. Why? To make a solar satellite. Well, wait a minute. This is primitive Earth technology. You guys could have built a solar satellite a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like you could. 
maybe with their limited resources they can't but you built an entire space cruiser <laughs> so <laughs> but yeah it's also like this is another recurring sort of sunbow motif is it's a device that's just going to like spray energy all over the earth nikola tesla style right mm -hmm. like we see this with the mm -hmm. broadcast energy transmitter in gi joe the movie but yep. anyway but yes it's a typical megatron plan i'm going to steal something that makes lots of energy and then i'll be happy <laughs> yeah I cut back to the Ark, and Sparkplug has come up with a device to put the Autobots back to normal. He's explaining it to Jazz as Blue Streak wakes up. Then Blue Streak fires on Jazz, who crouches behind a console. Jazz then jumps out and dazzles him with his speakers and lights show, which distracts Blue Streak long enough for Sparkplug to run up and attach his doohickey to Blue Streak's leg. You gotta describe what this doohickey looks like. <laughs> Go for it. Okay, it, it kind of looks like an Autobot moon, but like the size of like a grapefruit, right? It's like it's like a little floral dairy sphere with some spikes sticking out of different sides of it, and it's gold with like silver spikes. And you gotta, you, you we can't skim over when Sparkplug is explaining how the device works to Jazz as they're getting fired upon by Blue Streak, right? <laughs> it's like they're hiding behind a console, Blue Streak's firing away, and Sparkplug is like, distract him while I'll get this thing on him. And it's like, okay, go do it. But he's like, well, let me tell you how it works first. He's like, first, drain evil. Second, recharge good. <laughs> this is such a Star Trek season three device, right? It's like, well, it's going to hit, it's going to recharge the system with positive ions. That's like what he says. And then Jazz says like, well, I hope it doesn't end with three, bury Jazz. And then he runs out and starts getting Blue Streak's attention. So yeah, he puts the thing on Blue Streak and what happens? A blue streak seems to short out for a bit, and we see his red eyes revert to blue. And blue streak is then returned to normal, and he reveals what Megatron's plans were. And they know they have to stop the other evil Autobots, but first they need to make more of Sparkplug's device so they can mm -hmm. use them on all the Autobots. Yeah. So now we cut back to Dr. Harding, who's running through the streets, and she's still on the run from Evil Hound and Ratchet. She climbs into a dumpster and hides. Yeah. As Hound shakes the dumpster next to hers. Well, no, he he picks it up and he crushes it. Like they're they're building the tension here. Like first they're showing the size difference, right? Like we see how big the Autobots are compared to her because we're looking up from her vantage point. And she hides in the dumpster to the right. The one on the left, Hound picks it up and smashes it into pieces mm -hmm. of his arms. Then he picks up the second one, which she's in. And then all of a sudden, what happens? All of a sudden, Jazz shows up. And Hound picks up the dumpster with the doctor inside and throws it at Jazz. Throws it at Jazz. And Jazz does not know there's a person in there, no. you know? So he just, like, jumps out of the way. Yeah. It's like, oh, yeah, dumpster hit coming at me. Jump. <laughs> dumpster hits the wall. What happens? Uh -huh. The doctor just gets out of the dumpster and runs away. <laughs> Why isn't there a Sunbow cartoon series about this woman? <laughs> Because she's pretty freaking awesome. It's like she's like just casually running down the streets with the solar power plans under her arm, away from two <laughs> menacing giant robots. It's like, ah, oh, climbing this trash can. What's the worst that can happen? Well, they might throw you against the wall. Ah, oh, that's all right. Let's get out and run away. <laughs> Holy cow. Dr. Harding, you're amazing. Well, we might have to assume that the dumpster was full of pillows. Oh, is that, is maybe, that your Maybe theory? it was behind a... Uh, mattress outlet and they were throwing away a lot of old pillows <laughs> it was what they do with those casper mattresses when you return them no questions ah, asked there you go <laughs> <sighs> and so maybe maybe that would explain why she's perfectly all right <laughs> probably not but maybe maybe so now hound faces off against jazz while spark plug sneaks up from behind and he plants his device onto his leg and it has the desired effect and returns Hound to normal. We get to hear Ratchet's evil voice when he's talking to Dr. Harding, but we never get to hear what evil Hound sounds like, and that bums mm. me out. I want to hear that guy's performance, <laughs> trying to do a menacing voice with that Jimmy Stewart <laughs> thing going on. Maybe he just couldn't, so they were yeah. like, you know what, Hound, we're going to cut all your lines. <laughs> Boy, I sure want to hurt you real bad. <laughs> <laughs> No, come on. Menacing, <laughs> menacing. <laughs> I'm mean. Uh, I don't know. You're not really selling it. We're just going to color your lines. Oh, I'm you, really evil. It could have, that actually, that could have been. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So. Hound is back to normal, which means they have successfully created enough of those little orange or yellow orbs to fix everybody, right? Mm -hmm. 
And seemingly it's like a one-time use kind of thing because they can't just reuse them on the other Autobots. They have to have a bunch. Yeah, yeah. So then back at that military base, Prime, Prowl, and Brawn are looking for more things to smash. They're just literally like walking down the airstrips saying, hey, are there many more jets around here? Because I think they could use some smashing. And Optimus is like doing like this really scary voice. As he's like saying, like, destroy everything, rip, every, like, you know, rip everything mm-hmm. apart. And he like does like this big action pose and like screams at his troops to keep hurting everybody. And mm-hmm. Bumblebee's like, I can't take this. This is mm-hmm. too much, right? Yep. Spike tries to stop him from running out, but Bumblebee is determined. So now Young Jersey passes out from fear as we head into the second commercial break. Oh my gosh, Old Jersey is going to pass out from fear. <laughs> Bumblebee jumps up on the plane. He's like, you're going to have to go through me. Oh my God, what? Against Optimus, right? Optimus, who fought all the Decepticons in Heavy Metal War, right? And, mm-hmm. and you know, was still functional after that. So it's like, what's, what's going to happen here? I can't take it. I cannot take it. <laughs> well, we need some reinforcements, so we need some real help to save Prime. So I think maybe we'll need to call Rambo and the Forces of Freedom. <laughs> He's going to show up in a helicopter, leaning out the side, and go, <laughs> and then Optimus will just fall down. Oh, I think you're thinking of UHF. Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not buying it. I don't think, like, Rambo and the Forces of Freedom, very, very exciting, but I don't think that's going to be enough to save poor Bumblebee. Okay, well, if Rambo isn't enough, maybe we can get Superman to save him. We need yeah. the Battle of the Superpowers Collection. The Superpowers Collection, Superman, the Flash, Lex Luthor, Joker, and other figures with power action, each sold separately, new from Kenner. Oh, everybody's got their own action move. <laughs> we see Superman punching the air as he walks, so clearly <laughs> he can handle this. <laughs> <laughs> but if Rambo and Superman can't save Prime, then we'll need someone even more powerful. More so let's powerful? Let's call Chuck Norris and the Karate Commando. Look at that vest. Now that's the vest of a hero. Chuck Norris, Karate Commando. Break it up, hang it down, fight for the people. Figure so separately. Thank you, Chuck Norris. Surely he can help. I don't know. I don't think really any of these toys will help us, so we got to get back to the show. Oh, my gosh. So we come back, and we see a military jet flying through the air that's suddenly passed over by Skyfire. And we know it's Skyfire because the pilots in the jet say, it's right. Skyfire. <laughs> right. <laughs> I guess story-wise or whatever, we've never seen another jet that looks like Skyfire, so that's I true. guess he's very identifiable. Yeah. And at this point, the Autobots and Decepticon presence on Earth is widely known. Mm-hmm. I want to like make like a quick little asterisk here. It's so interesting that they chose that direction because in so many other adventure cartoons, like the presence of the heroes always has to be kept a secret. Clark Kent, mm-hmm. Superman, Prince Adam, and He-Man, you know? But in G.I. Joe and Transformers, it's like, nope, everybody just knows about us, even though in G.I. Joe, like, it's a super secret <laughs> organization. Mm-hmm. But like, like, it's interesting that they just toss that whole idea out of being hidden. Yeah. But especially because it's robots in disguise. I'm not criticizing them for that. I actually think it's like, it's it was probably a prescient move because I think the whole secret identity thing is increasingly out of favor, even though I think there's a lot of utility to it for philosophical reasons, but we don't have to go into that here. Anybody wants to hear about that, you can sign up for my Patreon. I'll do a Transformers <laughs> talk on that. But anyway, yeah, so like they're like, hey, it's Skyfire, and Skyfire does what? He's like, oh, hello, fellas. <laughs> The Autobot Air Guardian circles back, and then he fires missiles at the jet. And this causes the two pilots to parachute out just before their aircraft explodes. Down on the ground, we see Jazz, Hound, Ratchet, and Blue Streak arrive with Sparkplug and Dr. Harding. The group brainstorms on how to get the Mind Fixer device onto Skyfire, soon deciding to use Hound's gun to fire it onto him. And then Blue Streak gets Skyfire's attention by shooting at him, causing him to fly down towards them. Hound fires and the device magnetizes onto the underbelly of his jet mode, instantly putting him in his right mind again. Yeah. 
and he lands and he picks up the Autobots and humans. It's a very sky fiery moment because like he's flying around and they hit him and he's like, thanks, I needed that. <laughs> you know, I remember saying after Fire in the Sky that I'm, I wasn't as big a fan of the more jolly sky fire that shows up later on. But uh, actually, I'm kind of warming, to, uh, warming up to him again. <laughs> I, I guess I didn't like the idea of him like instantly enjoying war. I like that right. whole business of him being like, oh, I have to do this war thing. I don't want to do it. But I like the idea of him saying like, well, if I have to do it. I'm not going to be a stick in the mud about it. I'm going to be the the fun guy to hang out with. (laughs) (laughs) They did an okay job of building some tension here, saying like, well, we can't hit him. He's like a mile high. And Hound's like, oh, I got to make this shot count. And they do a little bit of tension building here. And I like the business where Blue Streak's like, one attention getter coming up. And we see like his shoulder cannons actually move as he's positioning them to like fire on Skyfire. So Mm -hmm. I think the scene is pretty good. I like that. We cut back to the rocket base where Bumblebee is trying his best to talk sense into Prime. And he's only getting lifted over Prime's head for his troubles. Yeah. <laughs> Spike yells at Prime to stop, but is distracted by Skyfire's sudden entrance. Skyfire lands and the Autobots disembark. Hound fires more of Spark Plug's doohickeys at Brawn and Prowl, and he hits both of them. So good thing it wasn't Cliff Jumper on this mission <laughs> instead, huh? There we go. You couldn't resist. Oh, <laughs> And then Hound fires one of these at Prime, too, but Prime dodges, transforming to truck mode. His trailer appears, and Roller, not seen since Episode 3, I believe, zooms out, ready to run over stuff, I guess? (laughs) Ow, my foot! (laughs) (laughs) Roller, by the way, doesn't make any of his cute beeps and boops this time. He just drives. Yeah. Yeah. That's because he wouldn't be evil enough. You can't beep boop evilly. Yeah, I guess not. You can't beep boop beep. <laughs> like, let's get the guy who played Bluto in the old Popeye cartoons to go beep boop beep. <laughs> and I like this moment too where like Optimus turns into truck mode, it stops for a second, and then it cuts to Ratchet. It was like, oh, he's transforming into his three component parts. And I'm like, mm-hmm. that's the only time I, I can think of where they ever say that. You know, yeah, they kind of like don't do any of that in the series except in like you said, episode three, where Optimus like talks to roller yeah but here we actually get that idea expressed in the dialogue and so roller comes out and runs over people's feet but what happens to the trailer (laughs) well the cannon thingy that's in the trailer begins firing on them that is until another well-placed blast from hound so hound shoots prime's trailer base and it fritzes and stops firing then roller speeds past them And Hound fires another device at it, hitting it on the back and fritzing it out. So now they've successfully de-eviled Prime's trailer and roller. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But they've had to use one thing on each of them. Mm -hmm. And now conveniently the Autobots are down to their last attitude exchanger. (laughs) You gotta have stakes. they can't afford to miss anymore. They can't. So brave Bumblebee grabs it and takes matters into his own hands. Yeah. And here we see Prime writhing in pain because two-thirds of him has been, you know, given this attitude adjustment. But then he grabs another jet off of the airstrip, breaking it over his knee. Yeah. Bumblebee runs up and tries to reason with him again. You've got to fight it! Don't give in! Ah! Ah! Help me, Bumblebee! Quickly! friend you saved me so bumblebee slaps the last attitude exchanger onto prime's leg and he turns away potentially about to be smashed but suddenly prime is back to normal thanking his little friend for saving him and here all that jersey gush about bumblebee's braveness i feel like it's it's like a foregone conclusion that i would get excited about this scene so i don't even know if it's worth going into it everybody <laughs> can fill in their own dialogue for what i would say about it right well that's my point and <laughs> Just a couple more episodes, we won't even have to do this show anymore because people will just watch the episode and know exactly how we'll both react to every scene. Yeah. Actually, I'm surprised we haven't heard you talking about how joyful it is for you to watch Optimus smash up the place because so much of your fan is him being utterly fed up with how incompetent all of his people are. (laughs) Like, this is finally him letting it all out. He's finally (laughs) like, I'm so done with all of you people. 
I do like that for all the other Autobots, it was like quick switch back. Like we just saw Skyfire. He's like, hey, thanks. I needed that. But for Optimus, it has to be like more effort. And I love, mm-hmm. I love that Bumblebee becomes up. It's like, I believe in you. You can fight this thing. Mm-hmm. Bumblebee wants to see him beat it on his own, right? Yep. He, he doesn't want the quick switch because that's how much he looks up to him. He even says like, uh, Prime, it's me, Bumblebee. I'm your, you know, and then he doesn't finish his sentence. You know, I was like, what? He's your what? What What are you? I'm your biggest, I'm your biggest fan. I'm your son. I'm your best friend. You buddy. know? <laughs> yeah, I'm your buddy. He doesn't say it. He never says what it is. Like, it's like, it's too big for him to even say, right? Like, he, <laughs> it's fill in the blank. It's something really, really, there's a big, powerful connection between these two characters, whether it's two-way or not. But it is two-way. Because when Optimus is cured, he's like, he picks him up and he hugs him. And I have that image screen capped and I <laughs> resort to it many times. Like, because as cheerful as I am, there are days where I don't feel so cheerful and I feel like the world is a big, scary place. And I look at that image and I'm like, okay, okay, center yourself. Oh my gosh. And like, I want that almost as bad as I want Prowl to say for a human being, you make one heck of an Autobot. <laughs> oh my gosh, it's so good. You did it, little friend. You saved me. Who saved the most important Autobot of all? The most important Autobot of all, the little yellow guy. <laughs> there, are you satisfied? <laughs> so we cut to later, and Jazz is explaining Megatron's plan to everybody. <laughs> and they know that they have to stop Megatron from taking the solar satellite to Cybertron. That's the other thing that they didn't make very clear in the beginning of the episode. He doesn't just want to steal the satellite. He's trying to steal the whole darn rocket so they can fly to Cybertron with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, he's like those stupid space bridge things where you have to be right on time or else you got to abort the mission. It's just too annoying. I'm just going to fly to Cybertron. Right, right. Like we have to infer that as usual. We have to fill in the blanks here. But yes, there was a conversation with Shockwave where he's like, oh my gosh, it's going to be like 85 quadrillion <laughs> astroseconds. I'm just going to fly there. Never mind. <laughs> You're going to see yeah. a giant rocket heading towards Cybertron. Don't shoot at it. It's me. <laughs> it's- I love that idea. <laughs> what does an earth rocket look like the mighty megatron i don't know it's just not gonna be purple if it's not a purple rocket i'm on it <laughs> oh my gosh but yeah he's gonna steal a human rocket that's only meant to get like the the satellite up into low earth orbit right it's like okay well maybe sound wave's gonna work some magic on it they're gonna compress the they're gonna bring some extra energy on cubes or something but they're gonna steal the rocket okay so the Autobots all board Skyfire and they head to where the solar satellite is about to be launched into space. And we see the director announce that the launch will happen in 30 seconds and can't be stopped. Yeah. We see the Decepticons board the reprogrammed rocket and it takes off into the air. Skyfire follows and Prime and Ratchet leap out onto the rocket, trying to remove the satellite from the rocket's top. Now Megatron and Soundwave see this and begin firing on them from the rocket's sort of doorway. Uh, it's like a doorway they ripped in it, right? Yeah. Like they're basically going to ride a rocket to Cybertron with a big hole in the side, but I guess they can do that. <laughs> and the two Autobots on the top of the rocket return fire on the Decepticons. Now back on Skyfire, Sparkplug, Jazz, and Bumblebee are brainstorming on how to remove the satellite without hurting Prime and Ratchet. Now Jazz gets a wild idea and climbs out onto the top of Skyfire as he flies, sliding up to his nose, jet nose, not robot nose, <laughs> and then he transforms into his car mode and unleashes his new speakers at full blast. Let's talk about the visuals of this just for a second, because Skyfire apparently is a TARDIS, because <laughs> like we see multiple Autobots standing inside of Skyfire looking out the side, and like yeah. Jazz is like standing full height, right? He's like, "Skyfire, let me out! I want to do something." And he actually, I think he even says, "Like, I guess there's enough atmosphere to do what I'm gonna, what I'm planning to do," which I thought was that, that interesting that they at least said that, right? It's like, "What I'm about mm-hmm. to do, I need to have air to do it." Right. But then when he climbs out on top of Skyfire, he's like a third the size of Skyfire. <laughs> like when he climbs up the nose, he's not like walking. He's like, like crawling because he's like got his arms wrapped around the nose of the jet mode. So it's like, mm-hmm. okay. So like if you go inside Skyfire, he's the size of three houses. But if you get outside <laughs> of Skyfire, he's like just a little bit bigger than you. Yeah. So. Skyfire's special power is that he changes size every few minutes and it's just <laughs> always done off camera. <laughs> yeah. 
He's, he's constantly mass shifting. That's why his bedroom isn't where the other Autobots bedrooms are. <laughs> Because like like his foot just goes through all whoops sorry <laughs> it happened again. <laughs> but yeah, what does he do when he turns his speakers on, and then yeah, we we see him transform into car mode and he unleashes his new speakers at full blast towards the rocket, and we see the sound literally rocking the rocket as Prime and Ratchet continue their work. Prime understands what he's up to, and the sound assault cracks the fuel tanks on the rocket. And now Megatron knows it's time to get out of there, ordering everyone to abandon Rocket. He literally says that, doesn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, Ratchet has managed to remove the satellite from the rocket just in time, and Prime and Ratchet jump off the doomed rocket, only to be safely scooped up by Skyfire, and they land on top of him. A Prime orders Skyfire to go up, way up. And into space he goes. <laughs> this is where we get that John Wayne prime again. Skyfire go up way up. <laughs> and once out of the atmosphere, Prime tosses the satellite into orbit. And I'm sure this scientifically all checks out, right? Jersey Droz, co-author of Science Comics Rockets. For those who don't know, yes, I co-authored a comics documentary about the history and science of rockets available from Macmillan. Tell your parents. And in, in it, we had to explore, we had to, we took it upon ourselves to explore Newton's laws of motion, which are like the fundamental ideas behind how a rocket moves. And I'm sure you remember an object in motion tends to stay in motion. An object at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force, which means in the upper atmosphere, Earth's gravity would still be working on that satellite, which would pull it down. But if you throw it fast enough, literally, this is Newton's thought experiment of the, the cannonball. If you shoot a cannonball, it goes up and it comes back down. If you shoot it faster, it'll go up higher and come back down farther away. If you shoot it fast enough, it will fall forever. So the reason there's zero G or microgravity in low Earth orbit is because you're falling indefinitely. It's not because you're far enough away that Earth's gravity isn't working on you. Otherwise, the moon would fly away from us, right? So... Optimus would have had to throw the satellite at a sufficient speed that it falls indefinitely. And it's possible that he did up there. So, and especially assisted by, by Skyfire's acceleration and velocity. So there, dust in my hands. Dang. David Wise knew what he was talking about. Did you get all that, kids? There'll be a quiz later. <laughs> Just buy Science Comics Rockets. There you go. And, and then you don't need to remember. It'll be it. an open book up. exam. So if you buy the book. <laughs> it's also a funny book, by the way. Anyway, back at the Ark. Back at the Ark, the day is saved. And Ratchet's explaining to Prime that this little device that Megatron put in the recharging chamber is responsible for this whole mess. Prime thanks Ratchet, but especially Bumblebee for saving the day. Oh, I love that line so much. It's like, especially you, Bumblebee. Oh, my gosh. I need to make that like a ringtone. And this irks Ratchet. Why? Ratchet wants more of the credit. So this starts Sparkplug commenting that it was his device that saved everyone as he and Ratchet start really arguing over who the better mechanic is. And Jazz interjects that they'll both get to put their mechanic skills to the test, fixing the quote, 47 jets smashed when they were under Megatron's control. Wow, 47 jets. Yeah. Their arguing turns to laughter and the episode ends. Mm. So I would imagine, just judging by this cartoon, Sparkplug and Ratchet could fix 47 jets in probably about mm, an afternoon. Yeah, yeah. He, he, made, he invented and mass-produced those personality restabilizers, you know, in essentially an afternoon. So, yeah, and then like Spike and Bubblebee walk up to Ratchet and, and Sparkplug with their tools. Spike gives Sparkplug his favorite wrench and Bubblebee gives Ratchet this weird-looking drill thing. Like basically insinuating that the two of them are going to fix all the planes. <laughs> but I, I, I'm assuming all the Autobots are going. I mean, they helped rebuild the Earth after the ultimate doom, for crying out loud. Even the Dinobots helped with that. So, <laughs> Well, here's a little thing to note, that back when the Autobots were turned evil in that scene, we saw Sideswipe and Trailbreaker among them. But we never see them again. So I think Megatron had them come to headquarters and rub his feet. <laughs> it's like sideswipe trailbreaker these dogs are barking <laughs> also if this would have been a more modern cartoon we would have found out that gears and huffer and those guys actually were recharged but they're just hanging out at the decepticon base 
And Megatron gets home and is like, what? What are you doing here? Like, we're now in your army. No, you're not. You people are terrible. <laughs> we're complaining still, but we're just complaining <laughs> evilly now. <laughs> we're not fighters like they are, Megatron. I know. <laughs> That's why I told you to go home. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know Mirage is just turning invisible left and right <laughs> you're like playing peekaboo with Megatron no <laughs> but yeah what happened to Trailbreaker and Sideswipe <laughs> so in closing this is yet another case of an episode where a sort of wild deus ex machina appears but barely factors into the plot I mean the whole episode could have been based around invisibility spray or they simply could have snuck into the arc another way yeah. You introduce a wild concept like invisibility spray, <laughs> like it's just bought off the shelf at the grocery store and it barely factors in. I'm not going to blast the author for these ideas or executions because we know season two was super rushed and there will definitely be some David Wise gems coming up later on. But this first one just it just seems more like a GoBot plot. Like, oh, I'm going to turn the good GoBots evil. <laughs> It just seems really simplistic that there's really nothing for me to do except explain the plot and complain about invisibility <laughs> spray. I mean, there's no theories of mine in this episode. It's like, what do I have to comment on? Well, that's another thing I noticed as as I was watching it again, is that like the Decepticons barely have a presence in this one. Mm -hmm. And they're really only there to be mustache twisting villains. Yep. Like you said, Starscream doesn't talk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, none of the Seekers say a word in this one. All Soundwave really does is tell Laser Beacon Rumble to go distract the Autobots. Yeah, like, we don't get to see any of the internal chemistry of the bad faction in this one. It felt mm -hmm. like it was the good guys show, and the bad guys were largely there to just antagonize the heroes. Yeah, and now, forward the plot. You know, one might assume that, oh, well, Jersey would love that because he really champions the Autobots. No, because I don't think you can get a full expression of what makes the Autobots so great unless you contrast it with something, right? And mm -hmm. the the contrast, I guess, was internal in the sense that they made the Autobots bad for episodes. But even that wasn't all that terribly interesting conceptually because it was just like they just turned into rage machines, right? Mm -hmm. and we get the creepy scene with Blue Streak. We get evil Ratchet. Yeah. But that's not, it's not a whole lot, right? It's mm -hmm. like the whole idea of a bizarro, faker, anti-universe version of, you know, mirror universe Star Trek characters, right? Mm -hmm. Seeing them with a different allegiance or like on the opposite side of the fence is always, I think, a fascinating thing, even if it's been done a trillion times. What does evil Optimus look like, right? Yeah. And in, in this cartoon, he's just like a rage monster. Mm -hmm. So... I love the scene with Bumblebee trying to talk Prime down. I mean, obviously, why wouldn't I? But the rest of the episode feels hastily constructed. Yeah, which I'm sure it was. And it just feels like an intermediate level cartoon. Yeah. Uh, without much special about it. And you can do intermediate level cartoons and have them be good. It can and has been done, but this is not really it. It's just sort of a little simple. Again, I don't I don't hate the play, I hate the game here. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that the rushed nature of season two is primarily to blame. And we can only move on and be confident things will improve. I mean, definitely David Wise has done some really great episodes that are coming up. So okay. it's no slight against him whatsoever. So what you're telling everybody is like keep uh, your subscription active because <laughs> there's better episodes coming up than what we're we've recently experienced in like oh, the last two. It's not like uh it's only season 1 that's good and season 2 we're just sloughing through. <laughs> <laughs> it's all City of Steel and Carnage and C minor from here on everybody. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> No, I mean, I think you're right. It's not It's not a, a bad episode. It's. It feels like it's like, uh, I'd give it a solid C as far as like, yeah, it, it has really good moments in it, but it's missing some really what I would consider to be fundamental sort of elements to make a good Transformers episode. And I think, mm -hmm. I really do think that unless you see how dysfunctional the Decepticons are in the way they all interact with one another, then the heroes don't get to shine quite as much. Mm -hmm. Right. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it'd be a good plot device if you have the Decepticons, you know, fail because of their own failings, more or less. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that would just point out, you know, that these are flawed characters. Yeah, or or, yeah, or their worldview is flawed, right? Mm -hmm. I think that those kinds of stories are much more interesting and meaningful. Like, like again, I'm going to keep going back to Fire in the Sky. That's that's fundamentally what's at work there, is that you have Starscream's broken worldview versus Skyfire's coherent and complete worldview. And... Mm -hmm. And, and that's what allows Skyfire to overcome the ambiguity of that situation and join the right side. But yeah, this is more like Megatron just failed because the good guys were like persistent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they used that Chekhov's gun on the wall with Jazz's giant woofers. <laughs> so yeah at first you're like oh wow jazz in the desert testing new speakers what's the point of this other than to show jazz is hip well they come into the plot yeah yeah and i mean it also it's one of those things where it's like i like that idea in concept of the heroes sort of overcoming the villain in a playful way but mm -hmm. that i think that's only really successful if the villain's been shown to be like really scary Right. And Megatron doesn't feel very scary in this one. Right. No. I mean, even though he like walks into like a, a NASA base and just like explodes it, basically, <laughs> it feels abstract and weird the way it happens. So. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. But there's better episodes are coming. And speaking of better episodes are coming, next mm -hmm. episode will be Traitor. Traitor. Oh, oh, yes. This is a memorable one. And I think we're going to get some character, well, some more hints at character development <laughs> in the next episode. Cool. I look forward to that one. So is this the part where I say how the show, <laughs> when the show comes out, when can people tune in? You can tune in on Thursdays is when the episodes drop at 4millionyearslater.com or just search for 4 million years later in your favorite podcatcher. While you're in that favorite podcatcher, if you're on one of those Apple podcast type dealies, you could also say, hey, I like this thing. I'll give it five stars. Don't give us less than five stars unless you don't like it. Then you could unsubscribe. <laughs> Just give it five, and then and then everybody will be like, "Hey, I should listen to this Transformers thing too." <laughs> yeah, just give it five. <laughs> what would Optimus do? He'd give it five stars, <laughs> unless he was Rage Prime. Then he'd just be too busy wrecking up jets to give us any stars. <laughs> Thanks everybody for downloading and listening. Until next time, I have been Jersey Drozd of Four Million Years Later dot com and Jersey Drozd on Instagram. And I've been Evil Rage Hoover, and I need to go smash some jets. Don't do that. I believe in you. <laughs> oh, I'm fixed. <laughs> okay, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <sighs>Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik, based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash nicholas-mahalik. That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S-M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 million years later at gmail.com. Visit 4millionyearslater.com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs> <laughs>